Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful evening whereby we can come together and we can worship you and listen to your word. Thank you because as we come before you today to study the Bible, we are reminded of the very fact that all these things that were written at all time, written before now, are written for our learning, that we through the comfort and patience of the scriptures might have hope. Thank you, Lord, because we know that history repeats itself. And the experiences of the children of Israel at this time are repeated in the experiences of many of God's own children. And therefore, Lord, we pray that as we look into this passage and these experiences, that we'll be able to have hope, we'll be able to have confidence and trust, we'll be able to have more faith in our Lord, so that we'll be able to face whatever lies ahead in Jesus' name. We're praying, O Lord, that as we study the passage of today, you will write these words upon our hearts. You will apply them in our lives. And you will help us to arise with courage and do what you want us to do, knowing that even the very ends are known to you before the very beginning. Therefore, Lord, we pray that none of our experiences or persecution, or whatever will come as a surprise to any one of us, but that we will serve the Lord without looking back. Lord, we pray that you anoint our eyes with spiritual eyes out, so that we'll be able to see very clearly what you have for us in the pages of your word. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered, and we know that we shall be richly blessed in your word today. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to the study of the word again tonight. In Jesus' name. We have been studying from Exodus. And if you have been coming regularly, you will see the rich word and the rich experiences that the Lord has been exposing us to in these words that we study. There are some people who are not very familiar with the Old Testament. And they do not study the Old Testament very seriously. But I want to tell you that the New Testament believers, before the New Testament was written, had nothing else to work with but the Old Testament. Not only that, when Jesus came into this world, in his earthly ministry, in talking about the kingdom and presenting the kingdom of God, unto the people. The scriptures that he had to refer to were the scriptures of the Old Testament. As he rose from the dead, and he needed to convince his disciples that all things that happened according to the plan of God, remember all he had to refer to was the Old Testament. Not only that, even when Jesus Christ was born, and the wise men came from the east wanting to know that where Jesus will be born, you remember again, what they had to refer to was the Old Testament. After Jesus Christ had been conceived by Virgin Mary. And then Jesus Christ was to be born. Joseph was confused. Remember once again that in chapter 1 of Matthew we are told, all these things were done. That it may be fulfilled. Again, it goes back to the Old Testament. As Jesus Christ convinced the Pharisees and the Sadducees concerning who he was and concerning what he did. Again, he referred to the Old Testament when he rose from the dead. And he was now telling his own disciples that these things should have been so. If you turn to Luke on your own later, Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 44 and verse 45, you re you'll see that he referred to the Old Testament. So then, the Old Testament ought to be studied. And that's why we're taking this book of the Old Testament and we're studying. It is so very important. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. What things soever were written aforetime, Referring to the Old Testament. And of course, Exodus is part of that which was written aforetime. This is were written for our learning. 
which means we shouldn't overlook them. We shouldn't even just read them. We ought to study them in depth because this is for our learning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 11. Now, all this happened unto them. For example, and they are reaching, you see that they are reaching for admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. It says, all these things that happened at the beginning of time, at the beginning of the dealing of God with the people of God, they are reaching for a learning. Why? So that those of us who are not living at the beginning but at the very end will be able to have instruction, admonition, correction, will be able to have teaching, doctrine through them. So, this accounts for the reason why we are studying the Old Testament. Today in our study, we come to Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. We're reading from verse 1. Let's look at Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. And after watch, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. I want you to stop there for a moment. The time had now arrived for Moses and Aaron to appear before Pharaoh and to confront him with God's demand. How important this is to us as the children of God. When we go out to confront people, we do not confront them with human opinion. We do not confront them with denominational desire. We do not confront them with our own wish, our own desires. We confront them with does says the Lord. If you are going to witness, if you are going to preach the gospel, if you are going to lead others to believe in the Lord, if you are going to do missionary work, whatever it is you are going to do for the glory of God, remember, you are confronting people not with your own ideology, not with your own opinion, not with your own wishes and desires, not with your own demand or the demand of the church. You confront them with God's demand. And so they went in and told Pharaoh, they said, God says, the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. They had already spoken all the words which God had spoken unto Moses. And he had done these signs in the sight of all the elders of the children of Israel. And what was their response? We see that in chapter 4. The latter part of chapter 4, verse 31. And the people believed. And when they heard, when they heard, that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, that they, he had looked upon their afflictions. Then they bowed their heads and they worshipped. So it had been a favorable response on the part of Aaron and on the part of Israel. And that must have encouraged Moses a lot. The Lord had inclined the hearts of the people to believe and to worship at Moses' first entrance into Egypt. Now, the time had come to declare before Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord. The time had come to bring the desire and the command of the Almighty before this tyrant Pharaoh. Thus says the Lord. Will Pharaoh respond in a similar way as the children of Israel responded? Would he believe and worship the true God with the Egyptian taskmasters? Would the signs have an immediate impact upon him? Now, here is where we need to take instruction. God knew, as he always knows, what will be the response or the reaction of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And God had warned his servant Moses that this will be the reaction. Let's turn back to chapter 3 and verse 19. Chapter 3 of Exodus, verse 19. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, 
You see that? And after that, and after that, he will let you go. God had given instruction to Moses. And he had said, at your first appearance, at the first confrontation, the first giving of the message, that Pharaoh will not let the people go. But God had said that he will stretch out his hand. And afterward, he will let you go. So then, we do not need to be surprised at what we're going to read today. We do not need to be discouraged as to what we're going to study today. As to the response of Pharaoh unto Moses and Aaron. I think we should apply this to ourselves. You may discover that as we preach the gospel, you may discover that as we bring the word of God unto people that do not know the Lord, it may not be the very first time they are going to yield and say, yes, Lord, I surrender. It may not be the very first time you present the gospel and you say, yes, Lord, I repent and believe. It may not be the very first time they are going to take in and they are going to accept everything you say that is coming from the Lord. And yet God says, I will stretch out my hand. I will walk wonders, perform signs and do miracles. I will make the supernatural to bear upon the hardened hearts of men and women. And now even today, you will see that whenever we present the gospel, the word of God has told us and assured us that if we meet with a little resistance, if we meet with a little unbelief, if we, meet, if we meet with a little rejection of the word, that we should not be surprised. Turn with me to Second Peter, chapter 3 and verse 2. Second Peter, chapter 3 and verse 2. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before, the, before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of our of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior verse 3 knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying verse 4 where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation so then there the Lord has told us that in the last days, and these are the days where, where we're living, that there will be scoffers, there will be unbelievers, there will be doubters, there will be the people that will scorn, and they will say no, they do not believe that the Lord is coming. So we should not be surprised. Moses and Aaron then were well instructed and well equipped for their ministry before Pharaoh and before Egypt. And it was time to confront the tyrant, to confront Pharaoh. Having the recognition and the support of the elders of Israel helped them to proceed in their God-given and God-appointed assignment and ministry. That's a good lesson for us. When you have the support of the church, the recognition of the church, the prayers of the leadership in the church, and the backing of the of the leadership of the church and you have materials like tracts like cassettes and you can say i know god has called me and the elders of the people of god they have also confirmed that god had called me and these are the tracts and these are the cases and this is the literature that the church even gave to me in support of the ministry that god has called me to that then prepares you prepares you to go and face the world because you already have the support you see, the support of the elders of Israel, the encouragement that they received, made them to be able to now go and face them and say, let my people go. From what we study today, we're going to look at three points. Point one, Pharaoh's reaction to divine request. Pharaoh's reaction to divine request. Understand, it is not to Moses' request. It is to divine request. The request is coming from God, although through Moses. Whenever anybody rejects that, we're not rejecting man, we're rejecting God himself. Any request that is made upon you to repent, to believe, to obey, to follow the footsteps of Christ, it's not the request of the church. It's not the request of the pastor. It's not the request of man. It is the request of God, the divine request. Your reaction to it will be your reaction to divine request. Point two. The tyrant's cruelty 
against God's people. We'll see that. Then point three, discouragement and despair in Israel. Let's go to point one, Pharaoh's reaction to divine request. We go back to Exodus chapter 5, reading from verse 1 again. And afterward, afterward, I've explained that to you, after chapter 4. And afterward, afterward, after Moses and Aaron had demonstrated those signs before the children of Israel in chapter 4, and those children of Israel, they had believed, they had bowed their head, and they had worshipped. After the confirmation, after the recognition, after the reaffirmation of their call, and after the reaffirmation and the recognition of their calling and their ministry before the people of God, they now went in unto Pharaoh. That's very important. Verse 1, and afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice, to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey, into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest they fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye Moses and Aaron let the people from their works get you unto your bodies? And Moses said, Sorry, and Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. Here we see the reaction of these people. Sorry, we see the reaction of Pharaoh unto the word of the Lord spoken by these people. You see, they said, Thus says the God of Israel. There were many gods in Egypt. If you look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, you see that on your own. But Moses and Aaron brought a message from the only true God. The message was not from one of the gods of Egypt. They said, this is the word of the Lord God of Israel. Moses did not come in his own authority, making a request based on national interest. He maintained, does says the Lord. It's a great lesson for us that when we go, and we preach the gospel. We preach the word of the Lord. It should be thus, says the Lord. Now do you see here, Moses did not introduce himself. I'm so and so. You know me here. You know my qualification. If you go back to Israel, you check up in the records. I am learned. I am mighty. Mighty in words. Mighty in deed. In fact, if you go to check up the records, you, you will see that Pharaoh's daughter, the Pharaoh before you, appointed me. And chose me as his, as her own son. And I was actually heir to the throne. And because of my qualification, because of my ability, because of my knowledge, because of my desire. And then to reason with this Pharaoh according to the knowledge of Egypt. Moses did not do that. Do you know there are many people that are trying to do that today? First of all, they introduce themselves. They talk much about themselves. And they tell about their qualifications about their qualities, educational qualification, political qualification, and all the things they have, and also their experiences. Do you see here that Moses did not talk about his experiences? The signs, the wonders, his experience, his power, his knowledge, his ability, everything that you could have spoken about. You see how people today, how they talk about themselves, where they were trained, what certificates they had, and what it is they can do, and the power they can manifest, here we learn humility. We who are following the Lord today, that what should be important to us is the message from God from heaven. It is the word of the Lord, our own Lord. And what should be important to us is to bring to bear the authority, the sovereignty, the majesty, the greatness of the God who has sent us. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. And that is enough authority. 
We're not taking authority from seminary. We're not taking authority from university. We're not taking authority from men. We're not taking authority from our own learning, from our own education, from our own experience. All authority is thus says the Lord. And now the message. The message that this, uh, these people, Moses and Aaron, that they brought before Pharaoh. Look at it in verse 1. Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. You see, it is let my people go. The message is not social improvement. The message is not a better conditions of service. The message is not a kind of reaching a kind of compromise so that the lot of the children of Israel will be better. The message is not increase their comfort, increase their joy, but let them remain in Egypt. You see, our message is not just to get the people healed and make them remain in the world. Let the people enjoy comfort, make them remain in the world. Let the people enjoy whatever it is that they want and still remain in Egypt. The message from God is, let my people go. Soul winner, except the person you are trying to win is out of the world and is in the kingdom of God, the work has not been done. They may be healed. They may have joy. They may be happy. Their mountains may be removed. Their problems may appear to be solved. They may have family, love, unity, fellowship, and everything. You may pray for them and there might be mighty signs, wonders, miracles to the, uh, to the prayer. But unless the people have left Egypt, they have left the world, your ministry as a soul winner has not been done. House fellowship leader, you may care for the people. And you may care for their children. You may even get to the point you are helping them to pay school fees. You may do whatever, anything, as long as they remain in Egypt. As long as they remain in the world, as long as they have not come into the kingdom of God, the work has not been done. The message is, let my people go. They must be delivered from the land of Egypt. They must be delivered from the world until they become the ecclesia. The people that are drawn out, the people that are taken out of the world and into the kingdom of his dear son, into the kingdom of light. The work has not been done. So let us notice that. Now this message, let my people go. How did Moses get the message? Well, again, this is very important. He got it from the Lord himself in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 verse 10. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt that you will bring out the children of Israel out of Egypt. Look at verse 12. And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you see that, you'll bring them out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Then in verse 18, and they shall hearken to thy voice. And thou shalt come, and thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto him, see this now, this is a message coming from God. The Lord God of the Hebrews have met with us. Now let us go. We beseech thee three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Then in chapter 4, reading from verses 22 and 23, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn, is my son even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go. Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So then, you will see that the message came from God. We should make sure that the message we preach comes from God. Not, again, our opinion, our dogma, our ideologies, or what we want. Jesus said, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. Not ideas of men, preach the gospel. Not opinions of men, preach the gospel to every creature. 
He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And in Matthew chapter 28 verse 20, teaching them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It is very clear then that the message should be coming from God. The message, let my people go, came as a surprise to Pharaoh. You know why? Because he thought of Israel as his own slaves, his own captives. He thought of them as his own people. Pharaoh was told in clear language that God required the worship and the service of the people he was holding in slavery. Let's learn something about God here. God had told Moses that he knew that Pharaoh will not easily let the people go. And yet, God did not immediately bring judgment. God acted in mercy towards Pharaoh. Before acting in judgment, God revealed his will through the spoken word. And he gave Pharaoh opportunity to respond in faith and obedience or in unbelief, disobedience and rebellion. That confirms once again, we're free moral agents. We can obey or disobey. We can believe or disbelieve. We can follow or we can reject. We can submit unto the Lord or we can rebel. We are free moral agents. But in God's own mercy, God will give us the word first. He will call us to obedience. If we obey and we believe, there will be blessing. If we doubt, disbelieve, disobey and rebel, then there will be judgment. But always there is mercy before the judgment. Declaration of the will of God before the judgment will come. This is always God's way with man. Do you remember? He sent Noah as a preacher of righteousness before the flood came upon the sinners of Noah's day. Mercy before judgment. A clear declaration of the will of God, the mind of God, the word of God before judgment will come if there is rejection. Remember that God sent forth Jonah to warn Nineveh before judgment of being before the judgment of being overthrown. Yet in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. And they were given opportunity to either believe or disbelieve, to accept or to reject, to submit or to rebel. In the case of Nineveh, they accepted. They repented. In fact, they repented were in dust and ashes, were fasting, were prayer before the Lord. And so the judgment did not come at that time. And he has sent forth one prophet after another unto Israel. Before actually they were carried away into captivity. Do you remember that later he sent forth his only begotten son. Followed by the apostles before Jerusalem was destroyed by General Titus in AD 70. And so it is with the world today. First the warning, then the judgment. First salvation is offered, then wrath and everlasting punishment if mercy is rejected. Here we are today. The word of the Lord is coming to you. If you accept, you'll be blessed. If you believe, you'll be saved. If you follow Christ, you'll be rewarded in a wonderful way. But then, if you disbelieve, if you reject, if you, if you refuse to repent and to believe the Lord, remember, after salvation has been offered, if you reject, there will be judgment. What does the Bible say? How shall we escape? How shall we escape the judgment of God? If we neglect so great salvation... Salvation is offered unto you. Repent, believe, and you'll be saved. You'll be blessed. You reject, you'll be damned. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, what was the response of Pharaoh? Let's look now at verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. That was the reaction of Pharaoh to divine request. And I want to tell you that everyone that has, all, that has rebelled like that any time has always faced the judgment of the Almighty. In fact, this will not be the only person that has said such a thing in the Bible. But then all the people that have said it in the past and the people that are saying it now they face, they will face the judgment of God. In 2 Kings, chapter 18. 
2 Kings chapter 18 from verse 28. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Let not Ezekiel deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Ezekiel make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. And this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do you see here that this man, like Pharaoh did, was challenging the power of God. Was challenging the majesty, the sovereignty, the will of God. Let's move on. You can read the rest on your own. Move on to verse 35. Who are they? Among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand. But the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, Answer him not. We do not need to answer such a tyrant. We do not need to answer such a fool that has said, not only in his heart, but with his mouth, who is the Lord? I do not know the Lord. I will not let Israel go. We do not need to answer them. God will answer them. You remember Daniel chapter 3? We encounter the same situation. When Nebuchadnezzar also challenged and said, Who is the Lord God? Again, we do not need to answer them. God is great enough to answer such people himself. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, reading from verse 15. Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sabtree, dulcima, and all kinds of music, musical instruments, ye fall down and worship the image which I have set, which I have made well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fairy furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? I'm sure you know this story. Judgment came eventually upon this man in Daniel chapter 4. So when any tyrant, when any rebellious fellow, when any atheist, when any unbeliever, when any scorner, or they call themselves agnostic, those who say, you don't know whether there's God or there's no God. When any of them, when they challenge the power of God, the might of God, the right of God to deliver a message unto them and to ask for their obedience, when they challenge the authority of God, God's, God is able to show them who he is. So Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? That I should obey his voice, that I should let Israel go. Then he said something important, important to him. I know not the Lord. I know not the Lord. Neither will I let Israel go. He was unacquainted with God's grace. It was God's grace and mercy that sent Moses and Aaron to him. Unacquainted with the grace of God. He was unacquainted with the truth of God. It was the truth of God they declared unto him. He was unacquainted with the irresistible power of God. Nobody has ever resisted the power of God and succeeded. Nobody. Nobody. Don't try it. You resist the word of God, the message of truth, the power of God, the demand of God, the request of God. And you think you are going to uh, go scot-free. Nobody has ever done it and has ever gone uh, scot-free. So then, you must make sure that you are not rejecting, you are not resisting. He was unacquainted with the justice of God, with the sovereignty of God. Because of his ignorance, he defiantly refused to bow to God's mandate. Are there people like that today? Oh yes, there are people like that today. We're told in Job. Job chapter 21. Reading from verse 7. Job chapter 21. Verse 7, and this is talking about the wicked, the unbelievers, the people that say, where is that God? They know not that God. It says, wherefore do the wicked live? Become old, yea, a mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them, 
and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are saved from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. That's how it appeared to be unto Job. Because it's Job talking here if you look at verse 1. And then in verse 10, they are bull gendered and faileth not. They are cow calves and casteth not their cows. They sent forth their little ones like a flock. Their children dance. You understand now? These are the people, they have all these worldly records and worldly songs. They have all these modern musical beats. They have all these things. They jack and shake and, and quake and do all that and jump. They, do all, they have all these things. And their children will dance at home and dance in front of the house and dance near their, near their pool at the back of the house and will dance also at all these wild parties that they throw. It says in verse 21, they sent for their little ones like a floor, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and the harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth, and in the moment they go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Verse 15, they say, what is the Almighty? That we should serve him. And what profit should we have if we pray unto him? Do you see these uh, people? These are the people that say they do not know that God. They are not going to bow to his will. They are ignorant of God's grace, of God's truth, of God's irresistible power, of God's justice and sovereignty. Because of that, they defy him. It says in verse 16, Lo, their good is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributed sorrows unto them in his anger. They are as stubble before the wind, and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. God layeth up his iniquity, the iniquity of the wicked, for his children. He rewarded him. And he shall know it. His eyes shall see its destruction. And he shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what pleasure has he in his house after him? When the number of his months is cut off in the midst. Shall any teach God knowledge? Seeing he judgeth those that are high. Shall any teach God knowledge? Some of us are thinking of teaching God knowledge. We are saying, oh God. Why should you allow Pharaoh to live even a single day after he said what he said? Are you going to teach God knowledge? Oh Lord, how will you allow a person like Nebuchadnezzar that brag like that to be able to make the fire hotter that these uh, people will enter in? I'm asking you, are you going to teach God knowledge? Oh God, all these, uh, why, all these wicked men, all these rich men, all these people in the world that are stealing and doing this and doing that, why don't you kill every one of them in one day? Are you going to teach God knowledge? Oh God, look at my husband. He doesn't believe. And the more I come to the Bible study, the more I come to worship you, he will beat me. How can this man still uh, lie on the bed and sleep and breathe your air and drink your water and he doesn't become sick and die that very night? Are you going to teach God knowledge? All these politicians of the world, oh God, look at, look at our situation. There is no job. There is no, we don't have this. We don't have this. Oh God, and they are even challenging you. They are acting as if there is no God. Why don't you do this? I'm asking you. Are you going to teach God knowledge? Let's be careful. Look at verse 22. Shall anyone teach God knowledge? Seeing he judges those that are high. Oh yes, he judges them. Moses might not be able to do anything against Pharaoh. He judges those that are high. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel might not have been able to do anything against Nebuchadnezzar. He judges those that are high. And then you see that Herod stretched forth his son. And he took James in the church and beheaded him. And he even imprisoned Peter wanting to bring him the following day and also kill him. But the church was praying. What happens in, what happened in, in Acts chapter 12? He judges those that are high. And in history, from generation to generation, that is what we have found that God has always done. He judges those that are high. Precisely, 
Such reply as Pharaoh gave is what many people are giving today. That is, those who do not know God. When God says in his authoritative word, sinner, repent and believe the gospel, the rebellious heart replies, who is the Lord? That I should obey his voice. For such rebellion against God's authority, judgment came eventually upon Pharaoh and came upon Egypt. And it will come upon all impenitent, unrepentant, unyielding sinners. God will take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us be careful of our reaction. Now here you are. And we're reading about Pharaoh. And you say, I am not like Pharaoh. You have been hearing about repentance. Have you repented? You have been hearing of the indignation of God, the wrath of God against worldliness. Against the things of the world, the customs of the world, the dressing of the world, the language of the world, the jewelry of the world, the cosmetics and the painting of the world. And against all these parties and all the frivolities and all the defilement of the world, the idolatry of the world. Have you repented? Or are you saying, who is that God in your heart? Although you come to church, although you say that you even carry the Bible, you say that you're a believer. How are you responding to the word of God? You hear the word of God concerning restitution. How are you responding? Are you saying, well, I am not going to do that. I am not going to make right my way. I'm not going to set everything right. I will not do it. Do you realize what you are doing? You are rebelling against the authority of the word of God. And beware because God dealt with Pharaoh. He dealt with Nebuchadnezzar. He dealt with Herod. He deals with those who are high. He will deal with you. But today you can repent. And you can say, oh God, I'm sorry for any foolish sin I have said or done. I will not ask again, who is that God? Now let us see his reaction. After he challenged, who is that God? We're not going to point you the tyrant's cruelty against God's people. The tyrant's cruelty against God's people. Well, let's read. Already we have read up to verse 5. You will see that the, after these uh, people, the people of God, they made the request. He just responded and said, you people, you are leaving them. You are making them to leave their bodies and their work. He was interested in the work they did for him. Let's now go to verse 6. And Pharaoh commanded, this Exodus chapter 5, verse 6. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick. As heretofore, let them go and gather straw for themselves. And a tail of bricks, that means the number of bricks, which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish or their thereof for they be idle therefore they cry saying let us go and sacrifice to our god before i go on can we uh, do you see that many people today still have the spirit of pharaoh in them their wife wants to come to the bible study or wants to come to church wants to read the bible and all they will say is that it's a lazy woman always wanting to pray always wanting to read the bible or it is their son or their children wanting to study the Bible, wanting to read the word of God, wanting to come to the Bible study, wanting to serve the Lord. Their conclusion is idle children, lazy children. It is because you are idle, you are talking of reading the Bible. Or it is a person working in a particular place of work and he says, uh, I want to go for retreat and he's asking for permission. Or I want to be able to close in time and meet the time of the Bible study. And the boss with the spirit of Pharaoh will say, it is because you are idle. You are going to do that over time. Whether you like it or not. And everything I wanted you to do before, in fact, because of the one wanting to have the permission to attend Bible study, attend worship, or serve the Lord, because of that, the privileges that were being given before, they are not going to give again. They have the spirit of Pharaoh, or it is unfortunately, sometimes it is the wife that the husband wants to serve the Lord, wants to read the Bible, and this woman is going to be shouting and screaming upon the husband with uh, abusive words, 
disrespectful words will say it is because you are idle. Uh, how do you see men like yours? I don't see that in my family. My father did not do that. My brothers did not do that. Always carrying Bible and saying that I want to go and preach. I want to go and do this. It is idleness that is a problem. And you see the way some of these women will talk in such a tyrannic, in such a violent manner. You will know that they have the spirit of Pharaoh in them. Let us be careful. Perhaps you are even a child of God. Perhaps you say you are born again. Perhaps you say you are even a worker. And then your wife says, I also want to preach the gospel. I want to evangelize. Uh-huh, you say, you come. The two of us cannot be doing that in this same family. Already I'm working for God. Already I'm serving the Lord. And you, you cannot serve the Lord. Both of us cannot be in the service together. You are idle. Or it is that your child is, uh, you know, saying, Daddy or Mommy, I want to give part of my time. I'm not going to leave my school. I still will study. I'm not going to leave my lessons. I still will study. I still will even go to the library. I will read all my books. But I want to take some few time. On Sunday, I want to go to our fellowship. And also, I want to be able to evangelize a little out of my spare time. You are lazy. You are lazy. A lazy drone. I will begin to call our children names. Is that not the spirit of Pharaoh? That is in such people that is making them to accuse their children, their wife, their husband, their servants, or whoever it is, accusing them of laziness. When actually these people want to serve the Lord. And so, in verse 8, it said, The tale, the number of bricks, which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish aught thereof. For they be idle, therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. You see that? Let them not regard vain words. In verse 10, And the taskmasters of the people went out, and their officers, and they spake unto the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will give, I will not give you straw. Let me point out something to you immediately. You see, Moses and Aaron, what's the old message? Thus says the Lord. These uh, taskmasters, what's the old message? Thus says Pharaoh. Their lives were bound with the words of Pharaoh. Their lives were controlled with the words of Pharaoh. They do not know any higher authority apart from Pharaoh. They, even these taskmasters themselves, they didn't know God. They said, does says Pharaoh. Are you like that? Does says my father-in-law. Does says my mother-in-law. Does says my husband. You must wear that jewelry or else. And since does says my husband, you know no higher authority. Does says my wife. We are not going to go to deeper life, Bible, church anymore. Or else... And so, thus says my wife, I don't know any higher authority, thus says my wife. Or it is, thus says my father, my parent. My parent says, no repentance in this house, no gospel church in this house, and there is no gospel message in this house. Which authority are you working under? These tax masters knew no other authority except the authority of Pharaoh. They said, thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye. Get your straw. Where ye can find it, yet not, yet not out of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks. As when ye, there was straw, and the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had yet over them, were beaten and demanded, Wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today and heretofore? Now, here is, there is a lot to learn here. And it is very difficult to even finish uh, this chapter, but we'll try and see what we can do. You see, there are some people that call themselves government officials. But let us understand, it's good to be a government official. It's good to be in a place of authority. It's good to be in a place where you are being sent to do this and that. But you see, there are some times that 
some things are said. And these things that are said from high authority, high authority just on earth here. And you are the one to carry it out. But be very careful how you carry out things that will harass the church. Harass the people of God. You see these tax masters, they didn't know any other authority. They didn't know the authority of God. They said, thus saith Pharaoh. And because of what Pharaoh had said, they were cruel before they became more cruel. They were difficult before they became more difficult. And they beat these people. And these were adults. In fact, these were just these were married people. And these were family people. They beat them saying that you must fulfill your task. Because this is what Pharaoh had said. We must be very careful that we remember eternity. We remember life beyond the grave. If you happen to be in the government today, if you happen to be in a particular place of authority today, and maybe a law has come down, and that law says this, this, and this, be very careful. Let me tell you something. There are times that husband and wife may have little problems. This little problem may make the husband, if the husband is foolish, if the husband is unscriptural, may make the husband to say, this is how I'm going to act against my wife. And you are like a servant serving in that family. And the husband will be discussing with you and will be telling you this to disrespect that wife, to do this and do that. Be very careful. Be very, very careful. That even though the man is angry against his wife, like Pharaoh was angry against the people of Israel and he put whip in the hands of the taskmasters and they began to beat the people. You cannot do like that. You fear God. You fear God. You cannot touch your master's wife. You cannot insult your master's wife. You cannot say because your master, your boss, is like this towards his wife that you are going to be like the taskmaster and you are going to do what the master is saying to do against the wife. That when he comes home, don't allow him to enter. That when he comes from the Bible study, you must not open the gate. Let us suffer. Let this happen. Let that happen. Let us be very careful. Because you know, God judges those that are high. And when their judgment comes, do not be partakers of their evil, so that you will not be partakers of their judgment. So then, here we find Pharaoh reacting. Because uh, he reacted with cruelty against the people of God in anger, immediately commanded the Egyptian taskmasters to increase the work of the Israelites like a tyrant blind to all reason. He was determined to break the will of the people. He regarded God's words through Moses as vain words. Vain words. Did you see that in verse 9? Look at it. Let their more work be laid upon the men that they may labor daring, and let them not regard vain words. You see, the one who refuses to repent, he becomes more impenitent, more defiant, more lawless, until with rare exceptions, the Lord abandons him to his own ways, and leaves him to suffer the due reward of his iniquities. Pharaoh said, let them not regard vain words. You know what he called vain words? The word of God. That God gave unto Moses at the burning bush. You know what he regarded as vain words? The words of the Almighty. He regarded God's word as vain words. To the man who does not know God, the word of God is counted as vain words. Idle tales. So does the rebellious, impenitent sinner regard the word of God, the Holy Bible. The Bible tells the sinner is a fallen creature to him that's vain words. That is separated from God to him that's been word. That is unprepared to die. He brags to him that's been word. That is unfit for heaven for the presence of God. He is in need of repentance of the grace of God or the salvation of God to him that's all been word. The Bible tells him plainly that he that believeth not shall be damned. But these solemn words, weighty words, eternally important words, Accounted as vain words by the skeptical heart of the impenitent sinner. Let the sinner be warned of the awful case of Pharaoh. Let him beware. And then we need to learn some lessons now from all that we have read. In this section of the chapter, let us learn this. The lot of the children of Israel became worse. 
Do you see that? They had been in oppression before, in affliction before. And now Moses came with Aaron. And he said, the Lord had appeared unto Moses. And he had given him this wonderful sign. And the people believed. And the people also rejoiced. And then they, they bowed and they worshipped. And then Moses and Aaron went to meet with Pharaoh. And to talk to him the word of God. But then severe measures were taken against these children of Israel. What do you learn from this? This is the way Satan always acts. If you see somebody that had not been saved, somebody that has not been born again, then the word of salvation begins to come to that individual. As the word of salvation comes to that individual, you know what happens? Eventually, as the person is wanting to repent, wanting to escape, wanting to be saved, wanting to embrace the Lord and believe the Lord, the devil will bring distractions. The devil might increase his job in the place of work. The devil immediately might promote him to a particular place in the place of work that, re regarded, that required more time, more service, that he will not be able to mind about heavenly things anymore. Not only that, some family problems may just crop up. That he wanted to be coming to the church. Hear the word of God. These family problems will just tie him down. The devil will just use everything to make this individual not to hear the word of God and not to continue in the conviction. But you see, the devil doesn't act in that same way all the time. You see, sometimes it is a man. One is it says, the man wants to just know the Lord and pray and get saved and get settled and just follow the Lord, do restitution, obey the Lord, that immediately the wife that had been negligent before, not very loving before, all of a sudden they shall begin to, you know, just love him and cook this meal and say, when are we going out? Are we not going for a party? Are we not going to this naming ceremony? And a lot of things will come. And then the man will begin to think that this woman did not love me before. And I've even been thinking, why is our relationship like this? And now I want to be going to church. And she is now what she has never said before. To go to party together. To go and drink together. To go to the nightclub together. To go to an evening restaurant. Just to have a change of atmosphere. You know, if I'm foolish at this time. And if I say church. I say Bible. I say repentance. I call upon the Lord. It may be that uh, the change that is coming on this woman now. I will not be able to see it again. That's what the devil is trying to do. To take you away from the conviction, from the repentance, from the things you need to do immediately so that you will know the Lord. You know, sometimes it's not just that. It's a person has been in the church. He's been saved, but uh, for years he has not been sanctified. And uh, as he now had the word of God, he was broken down. And he really wanted to be sanctified. And he said, this time I'm going to get through this thing. He waves the Christ. He prays, he agonizes, seeking the face of the Lord, consecrating himself. And it is just at that same very time, you know, the devil times a lot of things. That the devil will just make it, maybe a leader in the church, maybe a zonal leader, maybe a coordinator. And say, everybody, rise up, press, you know, press, you know. You continue your prayer at home. We have important information for you. We're going to do this and we'll lay down all the things that we need to do. All the bricks we need to make. All the straw we need to gather. All the activities we need to get into. By the time all that is done for a few days, the conviction, the burden, the sorrow, the eagerness, the consecration, and the fervency to want to get sanctified, everything is gone. Sometimes it is uh, even among workers that a worker will hear the word of God and a worker will say this time I must be baptized in the Holy Ghost uh -uh. I have been saved now seven years nine years ten years I have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost this time I must settle it once and for all and the burden is coming upon her or the burden is coming upon him and he's saying I will get I will get through this time praying and praying, just laying everything upon the altar, saying, oh God, you must baptize me in the Holy Ghost. It may be at such a time. You see, the devil is very clever. Do you know, my brothers and sisters, the devil may want to begin to use any of us leaders without our knowing. Don't you know that's the way the devil used Peter? And he took the Lord and rebuked him and said, that will not happen unto you. 
You see, the devil can use any of us. And then it is at that time, ah, brother, brother, don't worry about experience now, Holy Ghost now, about this and that now. We must cover this ground. We must do this. All our bricks and blocks we must make. We mu and we're not going to give you straw anymore. And nothing at all. We must do it. And activity will increase. Everything will increase. This has always been the desire of the devil and the tactics of the devil. It turns out to be the method of Pharaoh. The cruelty of Pharaoh. I hope that you are not a hindrance to people who want to get saved. I hope you are not a hindrance to people who want to get sanctified. I hope you are not a hindrance to people who want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I hope you are not a hindrance to people who are praying and saying, God, I must have grace to do my restitution this time. I need grace. Be because, you know, some, the restitution actually needs grace to carry out. And this fellow is praying and praying and praying. Oh God, give me grace at this time. I hope that is not the time you are overburdening them and laying um, responsibilities and activities upon them so that they will not be able to do what actually the Lord wants them to do. Let's look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. There's no time to read the whole passage, but on your own you can read verses 37 to 42. Let me just read verse 42 to you. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. The deliverance was near. The deliverer was very near. Jesus Christ was about to deliver the child. It was at that very time the devil took that child and tore him and wanted to even kill him. Sometimes, you know, it is so very bad. In fact, people say, or writing says, it is darkest before dawn. That is when your morning is about to break out with new light, with great expectation, with wonderful glory. Sometimes it may be darkest before the dawn. And so we should learn. But let us learn another thing again from this action of Pharaoh and from the action of the taskmasters in verse in chapter 29 of the Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 12. If a ruler hacking to lies, all his servants are wicked. If a ruler hacking to lies, all his servants are wicked. Do you understand this? Pharaoh had listened to the lies of the devil. The lies of the devil said the people are idle. So, to make them not to be idle, give them work. And then he called his own servants and said, These people are idle. Pharaoh the ruler had hacking unto lies. And then all his servants became wicked. Do you see that even in life today? In the place of work, if the boss in that place of work listens to lies, all, imme all his immediate subordinates are going to be wicked against the junior staff. The same thing if the husband hacking to lies, the lie of, of his own mother, all his actions and the other brothers and sisters of that husband, they are going to be wicked unto the wife. Not only that, in the church, if a coordinator hacking to lies, coordinator, listen, you know, by the grace of God, I've been a leader for some time. And I know how people talk. You know, some people can come to you and talk and present their story and talk about a particular brother, about a particular sister, and everything when you check up will be a lie. But before you check up, that the story will be believable. The story will, will be so wonderful, you will say, that is that so? If you are not careful, all your servants, that is all the people that are working under you, all the other Zuna leaders and the area leaders, they are going to be wicked against that person. And you have not even listened to that person yourself. Because if a leader, if a ruler hacking to lies, all his servants are wicked. Well, we've seen the uh, cruelty of Pharaoh. We've seen what he did. But we've learned our lesson. That sometimes for a person who is coming to know the Lord, who is coming to have the deliverance from the Lord, it may be worse before things actually become better. Now let's go to the last point. This is discouragement and despair in Israel. Discouragement and despair in Israel. Exodus, I'm reading to you once again from chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5, reading now from verse 15. Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? 
there is no straw given unto thy servants. And they say unto us, Make brick. And behold, thy servants are beaching. But the fault is in thine own people. But he said, Ye are idle. Ye are idle. Therefore ye say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now. And what? For there shall no straw be given you. Yet ye shall deliver the tale, the number of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case. After it was said, Ye shall not minish or diminish or lessen aught from your bricks of your daily work. You see, these officers were Israelites. They went to uh, Pharaoh to appeal. Can we appeal to Satan? No. Satan will never be reasonable. Whatever you tell him, he's not going to accept. It's not going to accept that that is too much. Can you appeal to Pharaoh? No, there's no appeal before Pharaoh. Can you appeal to Nebuchadnezzar? No, not at all. Can you appeal to Herod? No, not at all. Here is the mistake we sometimes make. The father-in-law has come. The mother-in-law has come. And he has pumped words into his own son. And this has affected his son, your husband. And then eventually, instead of going on your knees, instead of knowing that this battle is not yours, but the Lord, you will go to the father-in-law. You might even kneel down. And you might say, ah, Papa, why this now? I married, you, I married your son. And I know you are Greek. And I, you know me. You know that I'm gentle. Since I came, you know I take care of your son. Why is all this against me? And the man will just say, hey, you are bringing new religion. You are bringing something. We are idol worshippers in this family. And you should know before you marry this, uh, um, our son in this family that uh, I am herbalist. I am this and that. And then you say, what am I going to do now? Don't go to the man. There is no point going to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is not going to change. But there is one that has power that will change Pharaoh. God Almighty will change that your father-in-law. Let me hear amen from you. Because the hearts of the kings and the hands of the Lord, he turneth it whithersoever he wants. You stay with us in this study. You will know later that Pharaoh, who said, who is that God? Later I was saying, Moses, pray for me. He even started to write prayer requests. Things are going to change. In our lives, things will change in Jesus' name. And so, we shouldn't appeal to these people. You know, sometimes you have a boss. And this boss is of another religion. You're doing your work. And now you are born again. You have been a nominal church goer before. Now that you are born again, you will give tracts to people. You tell them God bless you. And you tell them God is on the throne. You tell them Jesus is Lord. You say praise the Lord. If any brother or sister during the break came to say, Oh, how are you my brother, my sister? You began to share together what you learned at the Bible study. Uh -huh. Then that other fellow who represents another person. Who represents another kind of goddess. Who represents another kind of a small deity. It begins to say, uh -huh. so you have joined the born again people. And then persecution comes. Persecution comes terribly. And then you write petition. You write to Oga. That is the chief boss. And then you say, ah, ah, what have I done? I've even made restitution. The money, the money I took from company before, I've returned. And everything, I've made right my way. I'm now a child of God. You are appealing unto Pharaoh. Pharaoh doesn't see receive. Pharaoh is not going to say, oh yes, this person is now gentle. His work is now better. He has made restitution. He's now dependable. Pharaoh does not talk like that. Pharaoh does not think like that. Who are we to make our appeal to? Let us make our appeal unto God. Look at it from verse 20. And they met Moses and Aaron who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. They said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our savour to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated these people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in, the, in thy name, he has done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. What do you see in those officers, those Israelites? Discouragement and despair. 
What do you see in Moses and Aaron? Discouragement and despair. These are strong tools in the hands of Satan to weaken our faith and to make us lose hope. The officers, as we have read, they were discouraged. And Moses too appeared to be shaken by this situation. The officers had appealed to Pharaoh on the brutal treatment by the taskmasters. But Pharaoh was absolutely pitiless and inflexible. These officers, they were Israelites, then confronted Moses and accused him of increasing their trouble. You know, if we're not careful, sometimes that's how you will accuse the pastor. You say, well, I was all right in my family before, all right in my place of work before, and since they taught us the word of God, and I just took everything, and I prayed, and I, and I gave in. And I removed all the painting and all the fingernails. I cut everything. And no perming, no, no cosmetics, none of these evil things again. And everything changed. Come and see the trouble I face with my husband. Come and see the trouble I face in the bank where I am working. Come and see the trouble I face from my colleagues, from my, from my neighbors. And they were saying, are you bereaved? Did somebody die? Are you money? What's the matter? Did you have a problem in your place of work? And I looked at myself. I said, no, I'm happy. They said, no, you are not happy. Look at the way you are. Look at the way you, you tie head and the way you wear dress and the way you, your face. How about your paint? How about uh, your permit? How about this and that? Any, did anybody die? Are you mourning? You say, I don't know what I will go. I'm going to do again. I used to say, pastor, pastor, pastor. The word of God. Deeper life. Our church. Our church. Since I've been saying our church, our pastor, our Bible, the doctrine of the Bible, if you see what I face with my neighbors, you see what I face with my place of work, that is the way it is. You see, but discouragement will come. Do not allow yourself to be discouraged. You see, even Moses, he became discouraged. It may be that you zona leader. It may be that you women representative and you women coordinator, you went to counsel and you counseled that woman according to the word of God. And after the counseling, you saw her the following week and said, Woman coordinator, God will judge. You have your own family. You have your own house. Everything is all right there. Since you counseled me, eh, you opened Bible, I saw the Bible. You opened verses, I saw the verses. Since I obeyed those verses, come and see fire burning in my family. And there you are, you are enjoying your own family. And now with the counseling you are giving me, I am in trouble. It may be that even you, woman coordinator, will say, eh, what is it now? What is all this? And God will pray together that day. And I assure this woman that you will be with her. Oh yes, God is with her. Oh yes, God is in that situation. Do not get discouraged. Remember, it may be dark before the dawn. Remember, it may be worse before it becomes better. Remember, that evil spirit tore that child almost into pieces before the deliverance. Deliverance will come. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. So, Moses now, having criticism from his own people. You see, this was the real test of the faith of God's servant. It is far more painful to be criticized by our own brethren than by those who, that is the people we are trying to deliver, than the people of the world. You see, when Pharaoh said, I will not let the people go, well, Moses would not have felt much, but now criticism, rejection. Even the people were cursing Moses. They said, God will judge between us and you. So Moses returned unto the Lord. He did well in turning to the Lord in the hour of trial, but his faith was yet weak and his heart appeared to have been confused. Because the way he spoke to God was not really proper. He said, O oh God, see now, you have not delivered the people. But then, God gave him the next line of action. The things he will yet do, which we'll be talking about next week. I hope you come next week. A great, wonderful lessons for next week in chapter 6. But before we pray, do you see all that we have learned today? It supplies a striking picture of what is awaiting the children of Israel at the time of the great tribulation. These awful experiences will still come upon Israel in greater measure during the time of Jacob's trouble. You can check up on your own later. The references are there. Proud to the second coming of the deliverer to Zion. That's the second coming of Christ. The world will reject the testimony of God's two witnesses like they rejected the testimony of Moses and Aaron. So the world 
will reject the testimony of God's two witnesses. That's Revelation chapter 11. And the Antichrist will deal with the children of Israel in a merciless way. May God count us worthy to escape the great torments, the great torture of the great tribulation period. The Lord is calling upon us to depend upon him. Don't be discouraged. Don't let disappointment, despair, discouragement take over your life. Whatever is happening now, the devil is just uh, wasting time. You are going to have the will of the Lord accomplished in your life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer. Rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Bring all that we have learned before the Lord. We have learned that as we evangelize. It is not our opinion, not our desire, not our own demand that we bring before the people. We bring the divine request before the people. Don't be afraid. Preach the word. Preach the gospel. Be instant in season and out of season. If God has sent you to a person like Pharaoh, like a tyrant, like a wicked person, don't say, well, it's not going to be converted, so why should I preach to him? Do the will of the Lord and declare, thus says the Lord. And remember that when you are preaching, the work has not been fully done until the people have left Egypt. Let my people go. That's the message. That's the expectation. Call upon the Lord. He wants to save the people. He wants to deliver the people. And you be obedient to the word of God. Don't count the word of God as vain words. Like Pharaoh counted the word of God as vain words. You know that God has talked to you today about your salvation? About your sanctification? About your Holy Ghost baptism? About being fervent in the Lord? Not allowing the number of bricks you are going to make and to delay your praying or to make you lose the conviction of praying, the spirit of prayer. Not allowing what Pharaoh is saying to discourage you or to make you go back to the worldliness, to the worldly dressing, to the palming, the painting, the jewelry, to the idolatrous festival. You tell the Lord, you will obey the Lord. You will obey the word of God. The Lord has spoken to us. Let's seek him for grace that will do his will. And let us make sure that as leaders, we do not hinder the people who want to pray. The people who really want to know the Lord. So we're not the people that will be used of Satan like Pharaoh. To increase activity upon the people that need to get near unto God. Except the people are saved. All our activities are useless. Let the conviction to pray have its way in the lives of the people. And in your own life too. And don't mind whatever sight, whatever discouraging things are all around. Just focus your attention upon the Lord. If the devil is fighting his last battle, before you are totally free, don't get discouraged. It's often darkest before the dawn. And remember that all these comments we are reading about is nothing to be compared with the great tribulation. Will you pray that you will escape the great tribulation? So the torments of the days of the great tribulation you will not experience. For the children of Israel, it will be very serious and very terrible at the time of the great tribulation, just before the deliverance will come. At the time of the great tribulation. You call upon the Lord that God will count you worthy to escape these things that shall come upon the world. 